Let's pray. Into that space of glory we are seated before you, Lord. And as best we can, we open to you. And by your grace, we open a little more. You have an invitation for us this morning, for every one of us. Help us to hear it. And then once we hear it, Lord, to move in the direction towards what it is you're inviting us to. In Christ we pray. Amen. So we're in week eight, next to last week of our Love Does series. And um, I have been hoping with our small group focus and the Sunday morning teaching and the actions that we've been calling you into that with the repetition of what you have been hearing about this most powerful force in the universe, love, that it would begin to not only shape our culture, our community, but that it would shape your life and your family and everyone you touch because it is the thing we need most these days. And sometimes when we speak to this topic, we really think we have some real idea as to what love is. And what I've been trying to kind of get at with you over these last several weeks is that whatever you think it is, it's that much more. There are so many facets and elements to this thing that we call love. And so we've been trying to understand it so that not only could we open to it and embrace it, but that it could seize us and take hold of us such that we couldn't help become but bearers of that to one another. And so this morning, I want to talk with you about how love takes risk. Love takes risk. It is anything but safe. In his, uh, in chapter 20, Bob Goff um, writes about 10-year-old adventures. He writes, Sweet Marie and I made a pact early in our marriage when each of our children reached 10 years old that they got to go on a trip with their dad. We called it a 10-year-old adventure. The idea was simple. The kids got to pick something in the world that captured their imaginations, fanned their whimsy, or sparked their curiosity. And then, we'd just go do it together. There was no planning, no preparation, no thinking about all of the details. We would just go do it. On a 10-year-old adventure, the goal is to do everything you can in the time that you've got. You don't know where you'll stay, or what you'll eat, and all the other details that usually accompany a trip. For three days, the kids and I commit to learn about each other and the world through what we experience in it, not what we've read about or planned into it. There aren't any other rules. That's what makes an adventure, not a program. He goes on, he has three children and he talks about each of their individual adventures. I'm only going to share one of them with you. And that is the adventure that he shared with his daughter, Lindsay. He writes, Lindsay was the first to turn 10 and she loved to have tea parties at the house. She'd heard of an event called high tea that some fancy hotels put on where you dress up and eat finger sandwiches and drink tea. And she asked me if I would take her. You bet. Where do you want to go? Well, I'm not sure. Where do people drink lots of tea, Lindsay asked. <laughs> London, I think. That was my best guess. Great. Then that's what I picked for my 10-year-old adventure. When do we leave? I got on the phone and found a couple of cheap tickets on British Airlines in London and a week later we were off. Most great adventures work that way. You don't plan them. 
You don't wait to get all the details right. You just do them. He continues as he shares the story. He said, we landed in London and hit the ground running. There was no waiting to counteract the jet lag, and there wasn't any luggage to get. We saw everything we possibly could cram in those three days. We went to Buckingham Palace, the River Thames, the Tower of London, the huge London Eye Ferris wheel. We ran through Hyde Park barefoot. We tried to make a guard in a bearskin hat giggle. We took in a play in the West End, and we ate fish and chips, and we said quite as we toasted each other with soda pops, lifting our pinky fingers towards the Queen. We didn't rest, we didn't sleep, and we didn't know where we'd stay, but none of that mattered. And of course, the last thing we did before heading back to the airport was have high tea at the Ritz. We sat bleary-eyed at a small, beautifully apportioned, perfectly British table. A stoic server brought us our goodies, and I only made it through one finger sandwich before I looked across the table and I saw a 10-year-old girl who would be 35 someday taking her own kids on the same kind of adventures. And I thought about what God must see when he looks at us, like I saw my 10-year-old turning 35. I imagine he sees who we all will become too if we start RSVPing yes to his invitations and we go after the things that he's made us to love. It's not all planned out for us either, and that's where most people get too nervous to take the next step. But know this, when Jesus invites us on an adventure, he shapes who we become with what happens along the way. Now normally, what I will do is, I will say, turn in your Bibles to, and we'll look at a passage, and I'll unpack it, and we'll make a connection between a story that we read here and a story that we find in the Scriptures. But this morning what I want to do is I want to share with you several stories. They're brief, but they're important. And as I share with you each of these stories, I want you to think about the singular invitation that comes out of each of these stories, okay? Think about what it is that each of the participants are being invited to do, okay? First story, Matthew chapter 4. This is at the very beginning of Jesus' public ministry. He is walking along. And this is how it goes. One day as Jesus was walking along the shore of the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, also called Peter, and Andrew, throwing a net into the water, for they fished for a living. Jesus called out to them, Come, follow me, and I will show you how to fish for people. And they left their nets at once and followed him. What's the invitation? Come, follow me. That's it. There's not a lot of details. He doesn't tell them where, right? He doesn't tell them how long it's going to take. He doesn't give them much to go on. All he says is, come, follow me. A little farther up the shore, he saw two other brothers, James and John, sitting in a boat with their father Zebedee, repairing their nets. And he called them to come too. And they immediately followed him, leaving the boat and their father behind. Does this sound insane to you? <laughs> it sounds crazy to me. Come follow me. And they did. They left their homes. They left their jobs. They left their families. And they seemed to do it pretty easily. It's as if there was something inside of them that wasn't yet in the place where they felt like they wanted to be or needed to be. And with this simple invitation, though they knew not where they were going or when they would get there, they left everything. Come follow me. As Jesus was walking along, Matthew chapter 9, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at his tax collector's booth. Follow me and be my disciple, Jesus said to him. So, Matthew got up and followed him. There's like some power, some magnetism, so, something in the invitation that when people heard it, they just got up and followed. Mark 8:34. Then Jesus said to his disciples, "If any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way." 
You must take up your cross and follow me. I think this is harder than leaving families and homes and jobs. Right? Giving up our own way. And then he says, after we give up our own way, that we must take up our cross, which is the instrument of death. I mean, that's what a cross was used for. So he's saying up front to you, I, hey, come follow, but just so you know, <laughs> if you're going to follow, what's going to happen is you're going to have to die to yourself and the things that keep you from the best that I have for you. So you just need to know that so that you don't get into this journey and say, well, this isn't... This isn't what I thought it was going to be. Now he said it, it begins and ends with picking up a cross, which is the instrument of your own death. Luke 9. As they were walking along, someone said to Jesus, I will follow you wherever you go. And I imagine Jesus thinking to himself, oh yeah? <laughs> Listen to this. But Jesus replied, Foxes have dens to live in and birds have, no ne have nests, but the Son of Man has no place even to lay his head. He said to another person, Come, follow me. So he said, So you want in? Yeah, 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 I want in. I want to be a part of this thing. Um, I'm homeless. You still in? Is this what you're signing up for? And then in the story it says, The man agreed, but he said, Lord, first let me return to my home and bury my father. So... This is kind of sketchy, right? So he's wanting a piece of the action. He wants to be a part of the deal. And he says, Lord, I'm all in. Oh yeah? Well, here's the deal. I don't really have a steady place to stay. You still want to go? Yeah, I'm definitely in, but I've got a couple things I need to go back and take care of. He's never going to see him again. If his father was dead, how long had he been dead? Right? That he would go and then say, oh yeah, yeah, I forgot about my dead father. I've got to go back and bury him. <laughs> right? He, he wants it. He doesn't want it. Right? We want it. Uh, we don't want it. Then another said, yes, Lord, I'll follow you. Um, but first, let me say goodbye to my family. But Jesus told him, anyone who puts a hand to the plow and then looks back is not fit for the kingdom of God. It seems harsh a little bit, right? Can't he just go say goodbye to the family? They're like, where did Bill go? Where, where is Jim? We haven't seen him, right? So somebody go say bye. They're making excuses. Last one. This is an encounter that Jesus will have towards the end of his life in public ministry with a, with a good guy. Like, seriously, he's a good guy and has been for a very long time. But he says, looking at the man, Jesus felt genuine love for him. He said, there's still one thing you haven't done because the guy comes and says, Lord, I want, I'm in. I have been following all the commands for as long as I can remember. I've done this, I've done this, and I've done this. And Jesus said, you know what? You're right. You're a great guy. But there's just one little thing I need you to do. And he said, I want you to go and sell all your possessions and give the money to the poor and then you'll have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. Now he doesn't ask this of everybody, but he asks it of this guy. And it makes me think, well, why would he ask him to do this? This is a good guy. He could probably use that money to like get a hotel room, right? <laughs> Find some place to stay occasionally, right? There's something in the story that says, you know what, you're a great guy, but you still, there are still things in your life that you are relying on. And as long as you are relying on them upon, over and above your reliance upon me and my leadership and my invitation, you're never really going to get what it is that you're being called to. This is a, an impediment. This is an obstacle. And it's in the way, so you need to get rid of it. But he can't do it. He can't do it. And so he walks away sadly, even though what he really wants is to be on the team. He wants to be with Christ. He's given his life to obeying the commandments. 
But he's unwilling to let go. He can't pick up his cross. He just, not here, not in the place of his finances. The invitation is, come, follow me. And some people do, and some people don't. And that's how it is. Some people do, and some people don't. But he wants all of us to know on the front end that if we do, it's going to cost us everything. Because he's not just inviting us on a day trip. He doesn't want us just to be a part of his club. He's inviting us into a new way of living. He's inviting us to become like him. And when he invites us, he knows that there's so much of us that's still unformed and not ready. He knows there are places in us that will resist, that will cause us to deep swallow, wonder if whether or not this is the place to get off. But he invites us anyway, because he has great belief in us and great hope for us and great desire that the life he's calling us into is greater than the one we would settle for. I wonder, what would be compelling enough to draw you away from everything you knew? What kind of invitation would be so powerful, so impactful that you would say to yourself, you know, I think it's time. I think it's time that I walked away from those things that gave me a sense of security over and above my relationship with Christ. I think it's time to walk away from those idols that I have been worshiping that has given me a sense of self-worth and status and a greater understanding of who I am, I think it's time for me to relinquish those things and to open my hands to the possibility of something greater than that. You see, when he was calling those would-be disciples away from their homes and their jobs and their families and their money, I think that was really, right, it was just the beginning of the invitation. And that actually, believe it or not, was the easiest part. <laughs> that sounds weird, I know, because it's, it's a great cost. Family, home, job, whatever. But when he invites us to follow, he invites us to join him on a journey where he's going to push at the places in our lives that are less than loving. He's going to invite his disciples to join him and go to the other side of the lake where they didn't want to go. And they're going to encounter people who are demon-possessed. And they're going to want to get out of there. And what he's going to want to do is introduce them to the demoniac and be a part of setting that man free. He's going to invite them not to go around regions like Samaria. He's going to invite them to go through so that when they encounter a culture of people that they otherwise despised and detested, their prejudices, he's going to invite them to let those prejudices go. He's going to invite them to let their judgments go because he wants to replace them with something better. You see, there are things that along the way we start to hold on to, and when we do, if they're not of God, they begin to deform us. And they reshape us in an image unlike Christ. And some of those things, without knowing it, as they start to break us down, they begin to lead us in a direction away from the very thing that we think we want. Love, risk. The reason that Jesus was calling them into a new way of life is because their old way of life wasn't working well for them. It often found them sizing up people and creating the us-them groups. Right? Still happens today, doesn't it? If I don't like your politics, if I don't like 
how you've grown up, your socioeconomic status, if there's something about your culture or your race or anything that I can find that sets you apart or makes you different from me. And I began to create space between us because you don't talk like me or you don't act like me or you don't look like me. And what happens is rather than drawing people into the kingdom of God, we push people to the margins. And what Jesus was doing is, he said, I'm going to invite you into some very hairy situations. I'm going to invite you to leave comfort and ease and predictability. And the older I get, the harder this becomes for me. When I was younger, comfort, ease, and predictability weren't my friends. As I've gotten older, I like them more. I just do, I have to admit. But what I, I'm learning is that they are the real enemy of my faith. Because when I start to live life close to the vest, when I'm needing to be comfortable and secure, it means that I'm unwilling to risk and move into mystery and receive an invitation that doesn't know where it's going. I remember when I was a kid hearing all the same stories that I tell you guys today and it not really landing on very fertile ground. I heard the stories and I don't know, they just they didn't resonate with me in any real way until I got to some place in my life where I just had to get away and I went to the far country for a while and lived riotously and I was lost but I didn't know it. And that's the problem with being lost most of the time is there's such a long period of time you don't even really realize you are. And sometimes for some of us there are these catalytic moments where your eyes and your ears and your heart is open and you realize how did I get here? And how do I get out of here? <laughs> how do I go back home? Would I be welcomed if I do? <coughs> And so, that's the moment where I remembered the initial invitation. And I started to make my way back, but I had no idea where I was going or how I was going to get there. But along the way, as I traveled, part of the awakening of my soul led me to a group of people who for the very first time in my life, I was 20 years old, for the very first time in my life, really, really had a faith that was attractive when I saw it lived out. I knew a lot of religious people, but that wasn't really attractive to me. <laughs> There's a lot of like us and them, and I always felt more like them than us. I was like on the inside, but I felt like I was on the outside. And finally, I met people who like were responding to the invitation that I've just shared with you, several invitations, but it wasn't burdensome to them. It was almost as if in their response to the invitation, it gave them life. Now, when you're young and you're in college, you know, it's, just, it's one of the best times of your life, right? You're free and unencumbered of a lot of the responsibilities that you will take on as you get older. I learned a lot of things. And in, in that season of life in school, I met people who would one day have to put their money where their mouth was. I have friends that I went to school with who, I remember my one friend, Robert. Robert, when he was a junior in college, just an old country boy, you know, from the mountains of Charlottesville. And I remember in my conversations with him, I was a year ahead of him, but I remembered seeing in him something that I really hadn't seen in many people. When I was with him, I felt somehow closer to God. I don't know if you've ever been that way with people, if you've ever met somebody whose faith was so real that you just felt closer to God when you spent time with them. It's really a powerful experience. And I remember him telling me, he said, I, I think God is calling me to the Middle East. And I said, come again? <laughs> and he said, yeah, I... He said, there are so many people who live there who don't know Christ 
and who need to know Christ. And he said, I feel that God's calling me. And I said, that's very serious, dude. Like, really, not just you're going to go on a mission trip. It, yeah, I really think I'm supposed to learn Arabic and move there. <laughs> 25 years later, that's exactly what he did. He spent a lot of time between Lebanon and Syria. His home has been bombed. Um, he's lost everything. He's given his life completely to being responsive to the invitation that God placed on his life. He's still there. And he will finish his days there. Many Muslim people have not come to faith in Christ. But his conviction is still white hot that that's where he's supposed to be investing his life. And if you took him here and put him in a safer place, he would be miserable. Because he's following the very path that God had set out for him. And when God calls you, he equips you for whatever it is that he calls you to. Now his example is extreme. Because I was in a community of people who have dispersed and gone not only to other countries, but all over this country as well. Some doctors and lawyers and architects and engineers. As I look back, I think about what a privilege it was to be with a group of people who at age 20 and 21 and 22 like actually listened to these stories and took this invitation seriously because it's, it's changed all of our lives. I left home and family and the prospects of other jobs to come here and be with you. At the time, people thought I was crazy coming to New Jersey. Right? What's a southern boy doing going to New Jersey? And everybody, if, if you don't know, has an idea of what they think New Jersey is. <laughs> and some of it's accurate, but not much. <laughs> now it doesn't seem like a big sacrifice. But at that point, I was leaving my family. And what I knew, and comfort, and predictability. I had other job offers that were going to pay me a lot more than what I'm getting here, for sure. <laughs> But if, if I would have taken the money or if I would have stayed in the space that I was when I sensed that Christ was calling me someplace else, I would be miserable. You see, because when I was a kid and I heard the stories, I didn't get them. But as I got older, like, I really heard them. And it, it turned my life upside down. Changed it forever. And now as I look back on like leaving those big things, that, that's not really the hard part. The hard part is every day waking up and determining, do I want to risk it all today again? Because there are things in my life that I have allowed to be there that have provided me a false sense of security and a false sense of identity. Things in my life that I have allowed unknowingly to block my connection with God. And the longer I hold on to them, the harder it is to let go of them. And before long, they start to shape and deform me. I wonder about that 22-year-old kid who was willing to risk it all. And some days when I'm looking in the mirror at that 49-year-old man, I think... Would you still do it again? Because I don't get to go back. I get to go forward, and I still get to keep making those decisions. It doesn't matter whether I would do that again. What matters is what I will do today. As I hear that same invitation, come follow me. See, that's the invitation. Come follow me. Learn of my ways. Be like me. 
And I say, yeah, but I'm, let me just, I got a couple quick things I need to do, and then don't put your hand to the plow and then look back. Set your face like a flint in the direction that you are going because it will take great courage and commitment to take the next step. Let me tell you, it doesn't get easier just because you make hard choices. It doesn't get easier every single day unless you're going to take a shortcut. And when you're taking shortcuts, most of the time you don't even realize you're taking shortcuts until you've gotten so far down the road and you think, how did I get here? You got here because you started placing your value and your worth in other things apart from the relationship that you've been called into that should self-identify and define who you are and what you're about. When God created us and had, a, had an idea in mind as to what He wanted for His children, and we moved away from that as the story goes in the Scriptures, it broke His heart. And God, unrelenting in His love, turned over heaven and earth to try and get us back into a place where we would be in close relationship with himself. And he gave his son to come and sacrifice himself without sin, perfect sacrifice, so that on, on our behalf, we would know that he's all in. He pushed his chips to the middle of the table and said, I'm banking on you. You haven't gotten it right always, but I still believe you can and you will. So much so, I'm going to give you my best. I'm going to give you my son. I just want to now invite you to, in the place of your own death, to receive new life. Would you receive this gift that I'm offering you? And this isn't just like a ticket out of hell, right? Because when I was growing up, that was the deal, right? They just scared you out of hell into heaven. <laughs> Yeah, I'll pray whatever prayer. I'll pray it every day if you want me to. I don't want to go there. But it isn't about that. It's about being invited into a way of life that starts now. And see, if we understood that, if we walked into that, it would begin to change us in ways that our families would look different in the way that we treated each other. And our schools... The way we interact on social media with one another, it would, it would be different. We wouldn't be tearing each other down and making judgments against one another and holding on to things that separate us. We would be looking for ways to build bridges and find ways to bring people who are lost back home. Love takes risk. It goes to the other side of the lake. It engages people who are different than you all because you realize that's what God did for you. And when you know that, when you really believe that, you'd be open to going anywhere like Syria or Lebanon or D.C. or Tenton Falls. You'd be willing because you realized just how much you are loved. And as you allowed that love to break down all of your barriers and resistance and fill and flood your heart, you would become then a conduit of that kind of love to give to others who so desperately need it. You wouldn't, you wouldn't settle for less. You wouldn't desire and place above all else this need for comfort and ease and predictability. You would go out, you would venture out, and you would engage people and places and things that you previously were unwilling or unable to do. I can tell you, when you respond to the invitation to follow Christ, He will never lead you into a place where He won't give you everything you need to be in that place as He wants you to be. He will give you everything you need. You may desire more, but He will give you everything you need. The older we get, the harder this will get. So we set patterns when we're younger so we don't have to wade through all of the stuff that we've accumulated along the way. 
when you travel with Jesus, you have to travel light. You have to let things go or either be stripped of them. Because one way or another, there are certain things in our lives that are just incompatible with calling ourselves Christ followers. And if I gave you five seconds, probably all of you could, it would flash quickly to your mind, you know. I call myself a follower of Christ, but I'm just angry most of the time. I'm just so prideful. I'm just so afraid. I just am so lost, so addicted to things that I have accumulated that I thought were going to provide for me what they don't anymore. And now I just need more of what I used to have. And it doesn't fill my aching need. And I've got to find a way to let go of that if I'm ever going to receive what it is that God has for me. It gets harder, not easier. And that may not be good news for you, but it's the truth. I don't think the hard part was leaving the family and the home and the geography and the money. I think the hard part is learning how to become like Christ every day and saying yes to the things that I naturally just resist because... because... And what I want more than probably anything else in my life is to be on a journey with people like you who help teach me and embolden me that this journey that we're on is worth it and that you're willing to take risks and you're willing to lay things down that encumber you. Back to my friends and then we'll close with a story. I had no idea what I had when I had it. My friends who've since gone on and, as I said, have been dispersed into various parts of this country and other countries, looking back, what I realize is that it was the beginning of the real taste of biblical community that I desired. We were kids. We were just kids. But we took seriously, as best we could, what was being offered. And it changed all of us. And it will change all of us if we do the same. Let, let me close with a story. It's how Bob finishes his chapter on 10-year-old adventures. It's one final adventure they took together, he and his three kids. He said, the kids and I learned about young boys and girls in India who were on a different type of a 10-year-old adventure. The worst kind, really. Slave traders in India called Mudalalis make slaves of young children my kid's age in order to work off an illegal so-called debt of as little as $10. Peasant families would often give a son or a daughter to a slave trader as a bonded laborer. Trafficking of this type is illegal in India, but tens if not hundreds of thousands of low-caste children are caught up in it each year. From the work I was doing in the country, I learned of four children being held in a cave behind the house of a slave trader named Gopal. The kids and I left for India that week to try to get them out. Is this crazy? He and his kids are flying halfway across the world because there are children who are being enslaved in a cave who need to be set free. He continues, We traveled to Chennai in southern India and from there to a small nondescript village 15 hours into the bush. <laughs> a local contact agreed to sneak those children out of the cave at one in the morning when the slave trader wouldn't notice that they were gone. We arrived at the meeting spot and I watched out the windows as my kids fingerprinted the children and documented their stories so that their wrongful imprisonment could be reported to the local head of government. 
Two weeks later, we received photographs of soldiers raiding Gopal's filthy cave to free the four children. The soldiers also freed 30 others in a local village who were under the control of other slave traders. That's the way love is. Not unlike loaves and fishes, its impact multiplies. Even though Jesus' disciples were older, they must have felt like my kids did on their 10-year-old adventures. They saw joy and suffering, triumph and tragedy, and in the end, there was just a man, an idea, and an invitation without a lot of details. The disciples were unschooled and ordinary like my kids, like all of us. Yet they didn't need all the details because they were on an adventure with a father who wanted to take them. You don't need to know everything when you're with someone you trust. And that's probably why Jesus' disciples never said that they were on a mission trip. I think they knew love already had a name, and they didn't need a program or anything else to define it. And we don't either. The kind of adventure Jesus has invited us on doesn't require an application or prerequisites. It's just about deciding to take up the offer made by a Father who wants us to come. And as we do, He will shape who we become with every single thing that happens to us along the way. I want to close by inviting you to pay attention to the things that have become impediments or obstacles to risk in your life. And I want to invite you on an adventure that is centered in the love of God and that moves out from that center in radiating circles where what you receive you give. I want you to not settle as you get older for lesser things. Because that's our temptation as we get older. To settle down into comfort and ease and predictability. But when we do, everybody loses. Because there's still other people on the other side of the lake there's people in places and areas living lives where they are completely and totally lost, sick, addicted, struggling, who need you. Who need you? But in order for you to get there, your first step is to acknowledge that there are things that you're holding on to that have caused you not to be willing to take the risk. So we don't go from here to India in a step, but if we're going to India or wherever, we start by acknowledging what is true. And whatever that next step is that we need to take, we take it. And then we take another one. And another one and another one because we refuse to bed down into needing comfort, ease, and predictability in our lives. It is the very enemy of our faith. Come follow me, he said. And you said, let's pray. When I look back at my life, God, there are things that I'm proud of and there are things that I'm embarrassed about. There are great areas of success and wonderful areas of failure. It's kind of a mixed bag, my life. And I'm sure it's probably not all that dissimilar from the rest of us. But now in this space in my life and this space in our lives, we hear your call and your invitation to join you on a journey where, we become, where we're becoming more like you every day. I pray as we listen for that invitation that you would show us what it is that we need to let go of, to jettison, to ditch, 
that your love would so overwhelm us that it would transform us into the people that you're calling us to be so that we could live into the life you have destined for us to live. No excuses, no blaming, no looking back. As you speak to us by your grace and with your courage, we ask you to help us take the next step forward as we receive and give a love that is risky. In Christ we pray. Amen.